So I want to say aloha and welcome um, to our third Thursday for April. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Lily and I'm Assistant Director for Training Projects and Research at the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center at the University of Hawaii. Um, the NDPTC is a congressionally authorized center that delivers FEMA certified training on natural hazards to emergency managers, first responders, state and local government, non-governmental organizations, universities, small business owners, and many, many others who are focused on community resilience. Our executive director is Dr. Kyle Kim, who is a professor of urban and regional planning at UH. He is traveling this week, so I'm not sure if he's going to be joining us. But in the meantime, our NDPTC Ohana is here to welcome you in his absence. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with our third Thursday series, um, this series is meant to highlight the latest in research and practice within disaster management and dis disaster risk reduction. So we use this platform to spotlight the work that our center is doing, as well as the work that our partners are doing, and to engage in some discussion about what we're doing um, together and how to do it better. Um, and so today's topic is focusing on the Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha'apai volcano tsunami event in January 2022. We have three amazing speakers whose presentations are going to focus on the assessment of what occurred. Um, they're going to spotlight preparedness, response, and recovery efforts and examine relevant lessons learned for the disaster management community. Um, and for those of you who are not up to speed on what the event actually was, um, our speakers are going to go more in depth about um, the science behind it and the response efforts. Um, but there was a large eruption of the Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha'apai underwater volcano the evening of January 15th this year, which caused a tsunami and ashfall in Tonga and the surrounding region. Um, it, it's going to be one of the biggest eruptions in the last 30 years. Um, and it was so violent that it could be heard in Fiji, which is more than 800 kilometers away. Um, so this is a very impressive event. There's lots to learn from it. Um, and before we jump into the speakers, here's how today's going to work. We're going to start with individual presentations by our panelists, and then we're going to follow that with Q&A. So I encourage all of you to be actively listening and post the questions that you have in our chat so that we can relay them to our speakers as soon as we can. Um, feel free to use hand raising features in the chat if you have comments or questions at any point. Um, and then also one last note, make sure that you're aware we're recording today's session to make it available to those who are not able to attend live. So, I've said a mouthful already, but without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Laura Kong. Um, Laura has served as the director of the International Tsunami Information Center since 2001. The ITIC works to mitigate hazards associated with tsunamis by improving tsunami preparedness for all Pacific Ocean nations. Dr. Kong received her PhD in marine seismology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Joint Program in Oceanography. So with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Kong to tell you a little bit about the event from her perspective. Thank you, Lily. I guess we can go ahead and put the first slide. See myself. All right. Um, so as that comes up, just want to uh, thank Andy PTC to uh, invite me to share a, a little bit of a, a summary and some, some lessons learned from uh, this event in last January. Um, I think it, the title is, is probably what, what's very appropriate, <laughs> certainly um, it was unexpected. Uh, maybe in Tonga they expected a very large eruption, but I don't think they expected a gigantic eruption. And we certainly didn't expect uh, the waves that, that emanated afterwards to actually um, result in a, in a shock wave that kind of went around the world several times over. Um, so you you see on this slide just uh, uh, the wave as it came in um, about. Uh, 30 minutes after after it was generated in Nukalofa and some of the impact in uh, one of the outer islands in Hapai. So next slide. 
So I think uh, just to set the stage for the next three speakers is uh, just a map of um, uh, tsunamis from around the world over the last uh, 4,000 years. And um, you can see uh, the, the red dots are where there have been deadly tsunamis. Um, and, and then the triangle is, is Tonga and, and the event at the, at the volcano. And you, you can actually see that it, for the most part, uh, the Tonga Kermadec Trench is, has not been the source of deadly volcanoes, deadly tsunamis. Next slide, please. So just a reminder, uh, mostly uh, most of all of you know what a tsunami is. It's um, it can be waves up to 10 or 10 meters or higher. And, and that's actually what we saw in Tonga up to 15 meters. Uh, again, anywhere, anytime. Uh, so we cannot predict these things. We are basically detecting and, and then warning. Um, and, and, and as you saw from the impacts, and I'll show a few slides, uh, flooding, extensive flooding. Next slide. So if you were to look uh, around the world and you were to look at where they're originating from, it's, it's about 69% Pacific, uh, of the, which 20% um, in Japan and 15% and in the South Pacific Islands. Um, almost all of them, nearly 90%, are from earthquakes and earthquake-generated landslides. So very few from volcanoes, yet that's what we had in, in January. And then finally, if you were to look at the details in terms of statistics, um, almost 90% are from of the deaths are from local or regional tsunamis. So it tells us something about what we need to prepare for. Next slide. So my final introductory slide, this basically says when we talk about tsunami warning and, and warning to be effective, uh, Essentially, what we've focused on is very rapid earthquake evaluation because 90% of the tsunamis are on earthquakes. And we've also focused on making sure we can detect and confirm the severity, so the sea level evaluations, and um, to be, have them be available within a, a couple minutes or tens of seconds. And you can see on the map on the right, uh, one for the seismic network and one the lower one for the sea level network. And there are global networks that are multi they're, they're real time, and they, they operate because we can share data. Um, but in the case of a local, uh, we don't have a lot of difference in general near source, and that was exactly the case in Tonga, to be able to confirm it quickly enough to provide a timely warning. Next slide. So just a, a couple of slides. A uh, brief background, I know Dr. Leonard and uh, will probably expand more on the, the volcano part of it, but on the 14th of January, uh, there was actually a small eruption. You see on the right, uh, it wasn't exactly small, but that's what the, the photo looked like. Uh, and it, and, and there, as a result, there was a, a marine tsunami warning issued by the Tonga Meteorological Service, which is the entity that provides tsunami warnings in Tonga. Um, and a marine warning just says, essentially, get out of the water. I mean, you don't have to evacuate from an evacuation zone, but uh, be careful. And, 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 and that warning was actually canceled the next day in the morning. And something like six hours later, um, this gigantic eruption, this is the one that uh, went 50 to 60 kilometers into the stratosphere. And you can see on the slides uh, on the, the left at the bottom um, at 507 local or 407 UTC uh, on the satellite, uh, uh, the Himo, the Japan Logical Agency, um, there is the first signal. So we know the eruption probably occurred a little bit before, seven, but that's the first data we have. Um, 73 minutes later, about an hour later, it was huge, 150 kilometers in diameter, just to give you a scale, um, up to an ash cloud up to into the stratosphere. Um, down on the, the lower reaches at the airport in, in uh, uh, Tongatapu, um, it's at 1713, uh, maybe five or 10 minutes later, there were some clouds, uh, further clouds and, and further clouds. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a meteorologist, but I wouldn't have thought that those clouds would be 
but I think if you heard the blast and everyone from the blast uh, and looked in the sky, these were probably very noseful indications that something was uh, something big has happened. Uh, just on the right, you see some uh, images from the 17th of November, 7th of January, uh, 15th of January, which is about three hours before the event, and then uh, a few days after. And what you'll see is, as a result of the, the 15th January gigantic explosion, um, nothing is left. So there used to be a, um, an isthmus connecting with a, a caldera uh, that was subaerial and that was blown apart. Um, on, on that gigantic eruption of the 15th of January. Next slide. So just dwelling back into the, the warning part in the early warning system, um, over the first two minutes, there's a lots of observations of what we call natural warnings. Um, these ash clouds, these blasts, uh, these uh, a shock wave that could be felt, birds flocking. Uh, within about 10 minutes, uh, the Met Service issued an urgent warning, which meant evacuation. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, as, as often happens, the phone lines are choked. There's just no time to it, what we call a, a normal SOP, which might mean a coordination calls, uh, text messages, um, making sure everyone understood what was happening. Instead, what happened was a, a, an immediate get on the radio and 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 say, this is a warning, evacuate. So on Radio Tonga, um, that warning went out and that was the method by which uh, was used uh, locally uh, for, the, for the remainder of the evening and, and, and days hence. Um, but an hour later, um, these, the undersea telecom cable was cut and you can see that on the right. Uh, there's only one cable uh, this provides comms from Tonga out to the world and the world out to, into Tonga. It was broken in two places. Uh, and from that point on, there was no sea level data. Uh, so you can see in a, a lower image, um, actually the, these are uh, marograms. Uh, one is detided, but all of a sudden the signal stopped. No outside comms, no phones, except by satellite phones. And that continued for uh, something like nine or ten days. Um, just for other information, the warning was canceled based on observations uh, the next day. But what we did learn is because of, I, I think, a, a fairly well-functioning early warning system, some things did not work, but they did were able to get the message out. There had been a lot of outreach before, uh, drills. Uh, in the last couple of months, only four persons had died. And, and then, then the lower one on the right, on, on the left, the lower panel, you can see in, in, in kind of, what is this, um, kind of reddish area, the parts that were actually evacuated. So very successful, successful evacuation and, and signage was up and posted on Tonga Tapu. Next slide. So a couple images of, of the impact. These were drone imagery collected by the Tonga Geological Survey. Mongo and Nomuka are two islands that are closer to the, the volcano, but Neua, uh, which is the lower one, is a small island uh, just sort of the, to, the, to the west and south of Tongatapa, which is the main island. But you can see um, the, the sand area uh, is uh, the, the waves that inundated the island. Next slide. Next slide, please. And this was a local warning, a local tsunami. So in this case, you're <coughs> acting on natural warnings. You saw the ash cloud, you heard the explosions, you felt the ground shaking, you saw unusual ocean uh, activities, you saw birds flying. It should have been enough or will be enough in the next time this occurs uh, to act and, and, and now the tsunami might come in. Um, just for information purposes, these are some models that were done by Pat Nett from the University of Southern California about a month later. Uh, seven minutes uh, to, to the westernmost part of uh, Tongatapu, um, 14 minutes to Namuka, 23 minutes to Nukalofa, which is the main capital. Uh, so uh, you, there was almost no time for an official warning. This was a, something you needed to act on and self-evacuate on, on the natural warnings. Next slide. 
So I just wanted to, to summarize kind of what happened, which is in the first 10 days, there was near zero communication, which meant um, challenges for partners like um, I think USAID is on there. There was no way for them to, to actually connect. Um, I was not able to, or the Tsunami Warning Center was not able to connect to the uh, MET service. Uh, very difficult to do any kind of rapid assessments. And, and this continued for something like nine days. Um, there was some ability to do, uh, I'll just skip to the, the red part, to do uh, forecasting that was supported by the, the VAC, the Volcano Ash Advisory Center uh, in Auckland and the Regional Met Service in Fiji. And they were advising by satellite phone. Um, this entity called the Chatty Vito, which uh, I think Ginger will be talking about, which is a hardened SMS, and some pictures on the right, was used to, to help transmit information in a, in a very limited sense uh, to the other islands. Um, but that chatty beetle was actually not working in, in Nukalofa, in the Tonga And the VH radio was able to be connected and, and some um, the, the Neo in, in uh, Nukalofa and uh, the Fiji Nemo was established a, a few days afterwards. Next slide. So in the in the nine, um, I just wanted to call attention to the fact that the first time anyone really received anything, which was after Digital and and Tonga TCC, the the cell service restored some some services uh it was a, a social media post that allowed us all to know that actually these our colleagues our, our friends were actually safe and it came across came across as facebook messenger and then it was at a time that we were finally able to make a sat phone call and able to connect um gns uh new zealand itic and ptwc with the met service um and and from that time on, we were able to actually do some daily check-ins very crudely with very terrible um, connections, uh, with cell phone, and then we were able to take advantage of a Asian Development Bank satellite li link um, from February 1st on. Um, but it allows us to, to try to work towards and, and, and restore the early warning system. One of the things that actually got out was on January 25th, an emergency request to the National Weather Service um, acting director at the point to request chatty beetle supplies um, uh, that that were going to help them communicate again um, with their, their colleagues. Um, so it wasn't until five weeks later that the cable was repaired and internet returned. So uh, quite a long time where almost no information got out and they in in, in return, no information um, in as well. Next slide. All right. Um, what are our lessons learned? Um, these are not anything that um, are shattering, but whatever we need to do, we need to do it beforehand. You know, the how will be issued, uh, what to do in a local scenario, what do you do if you have sirens? Um, who's going to issue it, you know, when, and, and what will the messages say? Because everything has to be known beforehand, um, because if you don't, then you risk it happens and, and nobody is, is able to, to know what to do. Next slide. And the most important thing the public probably needs to know is if you have evacuation routes. And, and in the case of Tonga Tapu, there are very prominent uh, signboards with evacuation maps and, and evacuation information and natural warnings. Um, next slide. So just kind of summarizing and, 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 you know, this was not an earthquake. So in many cases, this was warning for an unfamiliar event. And, and I think we would say that the Met Service did a nice job of um, uh, understanding what was happening and, and being safe and conservative um, for the public. Uh, they could not do anything and, until it was actually detected. Um, 
remember the past. So the fact that this there was an eruption before that was a small waves and there was a marine warning the day before helped to, to know or have the people um, understand what was happening and then what to do. And then finally, um, the supplies uh, very pertinent here, the, the natural warnings, and these were not the same warnings as a natural warnings as an earthquake. Um, but in, in many ways, they were also natural warnings of a volcano erupting, a very gigantic eruption of hearing that and feeling the, 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 the ground shake because of the, the boom. Um, and so people knew something was going to happen since it's never happened before. So um, take heed, um, act to be safe, uh, safe than sorry. Next slide. So lessons learned, um, I, I can't emphasize more that almost for the most part, almost always your tsunami is going to be generated by an earthquake. Um, so prepare for earthquakes, but be aware there's another 13% that could be non-earthquakes. Um, especially for, for Tonga and a lot of the South Pacific and even for the Big Island, um, be ready, get it, get know in advance uh, what to do, know at least how long it's going to take. Um, I think we have some nice stories from American Samoa in, in 2009. People knew um, just from simple briefings we had made that it was about 15 minutes. They had 15 minutes before a wave would hit. So that was essential. Um, they knew they didn't have time and, and, and they had to get out and plan ahead, practice. And then finally, if it's a local event, don't wait for the warning. You, you need to act yourself um, and take take your personal action, take personal responsibility. Um, I think Ginger will be talking a lot about com communications and, and some of the training they also do. But, you know, communications are so essential, uh, whether it's for the, the authoritative warning or even for people sharing with family and friends um, what, what's happening, what's not happening, what to do and what not to do. Um, we, we really underestimate its value until it's not there. And when it's not there, it's, it's so frustrating. Um, things that were so simple um, now cannot be done. And, uh, but you know, it's, it's something we, especially for tsunamis, we, we know this happens all the time. So we should plan to expect that. Next slide. Yes. So I just wanted to leave this with you. Um, it's just a general, a proverb that, that was been uh, used, um, it's a olelo no eao, which is a, a proverb, a Hawaiian proverb or wise saying. Essentially, it's a person who fails to watch out often loses. Never turn your back to the sea. So it's it's something that, you know, practical, and it applies not only to tsunamis, but certainly storm surges and surfing. So I guess you can go ahead and play it. But I think just hit next. Slide. That work out? No, oh, that didn't work out. Let me. No, I guess that's fine. Um, and I think that's that's all I wanted to say. Thank you Appreciate so much it. for that. Um, I'm sorry that the, the recording didn't work out, but thank you for reading it aloud for us. Many of the topics that you touched upon connect with um, Graham's presentation as well as Ginger, especially with the communications aspect and this being such a unique um, natural hazard um, in the sense that it was not triggered by an earthquake, but rather a volcano um, and all the implications for emergency management around that. Um, uh, there was one question from the audience that I think would be better asked now than for the panel, which is, uh, are there updated tsunami forecasted models for this kind of event? Uh, so for a volcanic event, um, you should not expect a forecast in terms of what the expected amplitudes are um, from a volcano source. And, and the reason it's not gonna be possible is because um, in that short, time span of minutes to hours, we don't, we're not have enough information about what the actual source is, where it is, when it was occurred, what type of explosive, implosive to actually be able to do an accurate forecast. 
Uh, so the answer is no, but you know, three, three weeks hence, two weeks hence, two months, of course they're very good forecast models now, but not in real time. Got it. Thank you very much for that. Um, all right, so we will be moving on to our next speaker. And so next we have Dr. Graham Leonard, who is a senior scientist with the Earth Structure and Processes Department for New Zealand-based GNS Science. His research includes uh, Taupo the Taupo Volcanic Zone volcanic mapping, New Zealand volcanic geology, stratigraphy and geochronology, developing effective response to warning systems, and quantifying and mitigating the impacts of natural hazard events. Um, so Graham, over to you. Thank you for joining us today from New Zealand. Yeah, good afternoon and evening, folks. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and dive in. I'm going to aim to keep it to the 10 minutes so that we do have that time for questions. Uh, okay, can you see that full screen? Yes, we see it. Great, okay. Hi, yes, yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm beaming in from Professor David Johnson's office at the Joint Center for Disaster Research at Massey University here in New Zealand. I bet some of you already know David. And this is a collaborative presentation on behalf of our whole research community in New Zealand and, and several, uh, or probably a couple of dozen key international researchers as well. Um, make sure I'm on the screen. Okay, so from a volcano point of view, uh, here, here's a little uh, location diagram, but also gives you a bit of a feeling for the nature of this volcano. You can see Nuku Alofa in the top left diagram, uh, and the, the volcano in question is 60-odd uh, kilometers north-northwest of Nuku Alofa, so no surprise that we saw a tsunami reaching uh, the capital and also ashfall from the volcano reaching the capital. I think the bigger surprise is the, the size of the tsunami across the Pacific, and I'll come back to that. Uh, if you look in the bottom right, you can see the nature of the volcano. It's an andesite stratovolcano, but underwater. So it's, it's got a lot in common with um, cascades or Aleutian type volcanoes or uh, Ruapehu and Tongariro in New Zealand, but most of the volcano is underwater with just its head poking out. And it's got a caldera or a rift in the middle. You can see that kind of depression area. That's what it looked like before this eruption. This is part of ongoing activity. Uh, we, we know there was quite big, thick ash producing eruptions, uh, maybe 900 or 1000 years ago. But then in the last decade or two, since about 2009, we've seen renewed activity from these islands, this underwater volcano and creation of islands. 20th of December last year, we saw a new eruption. Those are actual photos from, from that eruption sequence. And you can see the little islands um, periodically get added to by soft temporary volcanic cones in the middle that then wash away. Uh, January 14th, uh, Laura's already uh, kind of pointed to this pre-eruption. Um, we said it was small, but 17 kilometers into the atmosphere is still a big ash plume. If you didn't know about what happened on January 15th at a volcano, you'd probably actually refer to this as a moderate to large eruption. It's just not an extreme eruption. And on January 15th, we had this extreme eruption. And what's remarkable about this is how rapidly that initial plume spread, how high it went, um, and, the, and especially the air wave that was associated with it. We look at those in, in detail. Uh, these, are, these are images from Alexa Van Eaton at USGS. Uh, an ash plume to 55 kilometers up, um, almost touching space, uh, initially with that over height in the, middle, in the middle shot is really pretty unusual. So the onset was at about, Earthquake-wise, about 4.01 uh, UTC, and then by about 4.06, 4.07, we can see it on satellite. Uh, within about 50 minutes, we had that very surprisingly rapidly spreading plume, the overheight, and it went on with a sustained plume production at a lower height for many hours. That's a plume of ash and gas. And then it, it tailed off with post-event seismicity recorded. Again, this is the, off the global location network for a matter of weeks. Uh, and this has been variably interpreted perhaps as magma recharge or magma transfer in the volcano. And that's still kind of ongoing search. Uh, basically, at, at, its, at its max, the two islands have been connected, like in the top left. Um, and then right now, the two islands are at the smallest, as you can see in the bottom right. And you can see the satellite image that that's based on um, at the bottom left. There's a bunch of work going on to understand the magma. I'm not going to dive in in detail. Uh, 
international and especially domestic New Zealand teams are looking closely at this. This is work between Jeff Kilgore and Shane Cronin. Uh, we've done a lot of work on samples flown in to New Zealand from Tonga. Um, there's something funny about the ash grains and the, and the, the magma chemistry. It looks like the, the magma was kicked into eruption um, and the explosivity was driven by massive water magma interaction possibly. And that might explain that, that multi-megaton um, atmospheric wave associated with it, which is pretty interesting. I'll come back to it. This is a series of six cartoons that I've drawn to try to bring together, uh, as of the beginning of April, our kind of incorporated hypotheses on what was happening. The main thing to keep in mind is we've got a bunch of cruises in the area, Korean crews, two New Zealand based cruises, uh, looking at the shape of the volcano under the water. So information is rapidly evolving. But basically in cross section, we think we had intrusion of new magma in December, 14th of January, we had this up to the um, tropopause eruption. 15th of January, uh, the Japanese suggest that they can see seismicity at 501, indicating maybe some sort of um, traps or subsidence of magma release. We could definitely see that plume by 506 local time. Uh, and you can just kind of see that diagram, that low elevation plume at the bottom. Now by 515, there was a magnitude 5.8 earthquake. Somewhere around there, something big happened. Uh, there's certainly potentially some origin time for tsunami there. Uh, there may well have been a collapse of the volcano and or caldera collapse where the, the top of the volcano actually collapses vertically down into the magma chamber once the magma disappears. Something big happened anyway. Um, we have an origin of a pressure wave. We have uh, lightning initiation about then. Uh, and it may well be an origin for those undersea flows that it disrupted the um, communication cables as well. By 525, 530, we had a really big airwave origin. And what we're thinking is maybe um, this collapse at 515 uh, led to that magma water interaction. We need a, he a heck of a lot of explosive energy to give that airwave that can go around the world. So but the big airwave is at about 5, 525 to 530 local time. And uh, that airwave looks like it also disrupted the sea surface directly. We had, a, we had an origin of a very high plume about then as well. So there's a lot of overheight. That's the beginning of the plume that eventually overshoots to um, almost up to space in terms of elevation. By 5.30, we've got a domestic cable break. So something had to have reached that cable by 5.30. Maybe that was what we call a turbidite, which is an underwater superfluid mud flow. And again, if I jump back, that may be from this original initiated collapse, if that's what happened. We're surveying that right now with Niwa. Uh, and then the last, the last of my cartoon images, after about six o'clock, we were getting ash falls at Nukualofa. 616, we've got tsunami arrivals um, ongoing. Uh, it wasn't until four in the morning local time overnight that the eruption and the plume of ash actually stopped falling. Uh, and then I mentioned those earthquakes in the weeks following. And you on these diagrams, you can see that A and B tsunami um, that were present in the other diagrams. Uh, the international modeling community has been looking at the kind of coupling of the direct volcano tsunami generation plus the airwave as a, as, as a potential reason for the larger widespread tsunami across to the edges of the Pacific. So somehow that A and the B managed to couple with each other. Now, fresh off the Twitter press, Shane Cronin, one of my colleagues from Auckland University, he took, did two weeks in quarantine and he's up there working with Taniella now. They took a fishing boat out over the caldera. The, the colored day there is all from pre-eruption, but Shane's plotted on a black dashed line from the, the course they went and the white writing shows the depths that they saw. Note that a whole string of, um, or a whole length of the east side and north side of the volcano remain at beyond 200 or are now at beyond 280 meters water depth. That's consistent with collapse of the volcano and or collapse and fall away of the volcano to the east side, which is, is consistent with that, that cartoon I showed you. Um, discussions just in the last couple of days indicate it might be quite a lot deeper in the middle and uh, the ship looking in the deeper water is having trouble finding uh, very thick deposits. So that the, the nature of the collapse, whether it's a sector collapse to one side or a caldera collapse is open for um, active debate among scientists from ships right now. Okay, I'm gonna spend the remaining three minutes just talking through the response arrangements, which is dear to your hearts. Uh, I'm not gonna read any of these in detail, but you can come back and watch the video if you're, you're interested in the details. The point of this slide is just from my perspective in New Zealand, it was a very complicated uh, response. 
The top set there are all the in-country partners we needed to work with. Then we had a bunch of external agencies, all with touch points in uh, Tonga uh, that we had to work through from New Zealand. And then we have a coordination agency in New Zealand of all of our volcanologists called New Zealand Volcano Science Advisory Panel, NZVSAP, and SURGE, which is the tsunami research community here. So that brings together all of those key scientists uh, trying to give advice. So you can see already a very complicated response environment. And we've got a lot of areas of active and potential work over the last two months. So again, I won't read these in detail, but uh, a lot around the ash characterization, monitoring support as uh, uh, Laura touched on, huge amount around characterizing the event from a, a, an eruption style point of view in the cartoon I showed you, building that hypothesis. And a bunch around impacts, looking at multi-hazard impact and loss modeling. I talked about the cruises and Shane's field work up there. I guess a lot of the ash characterization for me and my colleagues um, at the universities was around messaging. What can we say before we've analyzed the ash and then after? And how do we get those messages in country with those communication problems Laura talked about? One key thing was partnering up with agencies who are already um, in direct contact with locals in Tonga. They helped us build, build infographics and translate natively into Tongan and get those um, key messages around ashfall and protection and, and actually safety of food and water. A lot of the message was positive. Into packages, you see the pallets on the left of food going from New Zealand to Tonga. These key message translated infographics went into every package that went to every village. We were also getting New Zealand Defence Force flights bringing us ash samples back and they confirmed we, we were not that concerned about the chemistry of what was on the ash and that drinking water affected by ash could still be drunk and food could still be eaten. Not very acidic, uh, had a lot of salt in it, that's fine, but low fluoride and we expect that from andesites like this volcano. So mainly it was a reassuring point and telling people definitely wash with the water, definitely drink it if you have no other options. We didn't want to uh, affect sanitation. Also supported uh, impact assessment reports that help with the financial response. I won't go into detail on that, but our scientists were engaged in, in this report, for example, from the UN perspective. And we did some ash cleanup estimates to help locals think about how much ash they were going to have to dispose of. And my final slide is just some early lessons. There was a huge value in pre-preparing our messaging and information. Uh, we can't I uh, can't overstate that. We developed a bunch of resources, for example, with Vanuatu in 2018, and we were able to rapidly be confident about what we were saying in terms of safety or not of ash and drinking water. We, we have strong pre-existing networks with the Pacific, and we exploited all of those. We were able to do rapid ash analysis because we had planning and experience from 20 years and 20 eruptions around the world. And uh, water supply and ash clean, it was more of a challenge than anticipated. Uh, for the locals, but we hear that from every eruption around the world. And finally, interpretation of the, the science of the complex uh, of the science of the eruption itself is complex and, and the somewhat unusual eruption is, is ongoing and very active point of discussion around the world. Thank you. I'll pass back to the chair now. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, we're we're very aware that New Zealand led a huge uh, part of the response, both from the scientific community and emergency management community perspective. So we really appreciate your summary. Um, and, and also, I, I think personally, the cartoons that you shared are my favorite part of your presentation. I think it might inspire some new training and education modalities for us <laughs> at our center. Um, so I, I didn't get any um, questions in the chat, but I selfishly want to ask one of my own since we've been sure. paying attention to this. Um, this issue of ashfall um, being such an impact on public health. I know you mm -hmm. mentioned that um, ash characterization was part of your work and translating warning messaging into Tongan. Um, have you, or are you aware of any initiatives for long-term recovery and cleanup um, that perhaps involve green infrastructure approaches or nature-based solutions for repurposing the ash? Yeah, well, so we, um... I'm, I'm aware that um, aggregate is in short supply in Tonga, so they certainly are interested in being able to use the ash. The reality is we're only looking at four or five centimeters of ash on most islands, a little bit surprising given the size of the blast. Uh, maybe a lot of it went underwater or into the water. Uh, so rain has washed a lot of it away, but we did off some of the samples that came back to New Zealand, we, we immediately went with University of Canterbury to test the use um, effectiveness for concrete 
and stabilization so it could be used for landfill. And so we were able to feed that information back to Tonga. So there's definitely an interest in how the ash could be reused, but actually um, not a lot of ash available to reuse. Uh, we were able to say it's safe to use in gardens, uh, safe to eat food from it, and that it would, would be able to provide um, long-term fertilization actually, because it's got nutrients attached to it. Yeah, that's fantastic news. I know that this has been um, on, on the minds of people who have dealt with volcanic hazards, especially in island communities where it's much more expensive to try to export the ash or um, remove the debris by, by taking it off island. And so finding ways to reuse it and repurpose it, especially if it is low chloride, not as acidic and not a huge concern for public health. So um, we appreciate your perspective on that. Um, okay, and, and with that, Last but not least, I would love to move to our, our, our last speaker, Ginger Porter, who is the coordinator of the Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistant Graduate Certificate Program at UH Manoa. She also manages the radio and internet for the dissemination and communications and hydrometeorological information, RANET, which has deployed over 100 satellite-based communication units in the Pacific region. Ginger is also Associate Director of the Pacific International Trading Desk, working directly with meteorological services in the Pacific region to bring weather observers for training in Hawaii and Guam. Um, Ginger, over to you. Okay, thank you, Lily. I just wanted to check, are you seeing my screen? Yes, beautiful. Okay, wonderful. Um, let's do that. Okay, so thank you to you know our, our previous speakers, Graham and Laura, you know, for setting the stage on the scientific side. Um, so this, you know, I wanted to to share a little bit of, uh, of a different perspective on the on the communication side of what had happened, um, and then from our perspective here, monitoring some of the traffic, the l very very limited traffic that was going on and transmitted via these systems that was mentioned earlier by, by Dr. Kong. They're called chatty beetles. So with that, I also wanted to acknowledge the role of you know, the USAID and all the different partners that have gone into the development of this, this system over time. This uh, satellite communication system has been around for you know, many, many years. Since 2003 was its initial development. And it has been deployed over you know, over, over as, as at least when I've been involved in the program, we've had over, you know, 100 plus units that we've deployed out to the, the Pacific region, as well as other parts of the world in support of the uh, transmission and receiving of weather information, its early warnings. Um, and now, uh, you know, over the years have become an operational part of uh, weather services and disaster management offices. Um, you know, so, you know, you know, looking at this, significant events and disasters um, can cause primary systems to be lost, as we've seen in the recent event in Tonga, diminishing, you know, the capacity to, you know, respond, provide uh, humanitarian aid effectively. And so planning and implementing comprehensive primary and backup communication solution is essential to maintaining critical operations. And we look at the span of different um, disasters or hazards, right, from natural to human to technological, all of these. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, you know, foundation of all of this and for us to effectively respond um, is your communications. Um, and so, you know, as, as mentioned by Dr. Laurel earlier, um, and also Graham, challenges spurred from not having no, any communication or very limited communication. So that means there was no information coming in and out. There was, it was hard to coordinate aid. It was hard to coordinate anything, period, because we had no eyes on the ground. And with the limited information that we did get out of the islands, um, you know, there was only so much we could do with that, the amount of information that was coming, coming out. Um, and um, so, you know, a lot of you, you've seen this many, many times, but the communication is a foundational element of your 
uh, disaster management and planning from mitigation all the way to recovery. It's, it's an integral part of the whole effort, um, you know, from all the, the preparations and putting things in place, your assessments to the plans and the policies and the frameworks to the coordination during a disaster and also to responding, restoring and reconstruction in the end of it. So, uh, you know, critical to all of this is communication. So, and looking at it from, you know, from, from what it is that you do need from a communication system or this infrastructure you need you know and these attributes that are listed there you need it to be realistic you need it to be affordable you need it to be user friendly so you know one of the things that we did learn throughout this event is the simpler the system the better um, that anyone not a trained operator but someone in the village someone in the community that we can provide uh, simple instructions or can read, you know, you know, step by step could be able to send a message out for help. And so that continues to be highlighted in all of these events and uh, that that we experience and at least we we get a, a, a look into. Um, redundancy, of course, is a big is a big um, issue. And so as mentioned earlier, also, there was only one cable um, going into that that takes traffic out of the islands um, and so that became a problem when that was severed that was it right it interrupted both your local traffic on island and as well as your off island traffic so um, the redundancy of that is very very important as well um, and low as I said low and high tech kind of systems are very very um, important in these in these situations. So, um, and so we look at disaster communications in general, just overall. We classify them as infrastructure dependent and infrastructure independent. And so, you know, in in your response situation, these are normally what you would see in in uh, respond in effort. So you have your radios, you have your satellite comms, you have weather radios, and you know, there, it never fails, this word of mouth, right? That's a, that's a form of communication that always manages, whether, whether the message, messaging part is, you know, can be a difference, but it does get the message out to where it needs to go at times. And then you have your infrastructure dependent type of uh, disaster communication system. You have your cellular network, your radios, your intranet, and other broadcasts public broadcast system. So that's kind of a, gives you a general idea of the different um, communication infrastructures. Um, so, you know, going directly into the, the Tonga volcanic eruption and tsunami and, and, and the le some of the lessons that we learned from a disaster communication perspective, um, you know, over 80% of the population was impacted by this event. Um, and so from both this, you know, from the tsunami to the, the volcanic, um, the ash to communications, and, and also look, look across the island to the different sectors that was impacted by, because of no communications from the financial um, sectors, the bankings, you know, they were not able to do any transactions. In addition to all the communications, you know, no messages in and out of the islands. Um, so, and that's, uh, you know, inclusive of all the, the critical infrastructure type pieces that would need to be operational um, for, for any country or any community. Um, so specific impacts on communications, I uh, mentioned before, no international and domestic communications due to the damage from the eruption um, of the undersea cable. Uh, it was severed in two areas, so one very near the uh, eruption location, and then one, you know, a little bit further out. But that that was that became a challenge. So then, then a lot of uh, discussions and assessments on is it worth is it even worth um, the effort to to go in and replace um, 
or restore the damage that's so close to the eruption site. Um, one, it's it's in dangerous situations, or or what is it that they need to do to bring back the communication on island, um, but not risk you know people's lives going so close to where the eruption was. Um, so you know those those discussions were ongoing for a while. Um, and then they they repaired the the plate the cable in place. There was also very limited satellite communications, but they were also hampered, right, because of the thickness of the volcanic ash cloud. Um, so that impacted the, the capacity of the satellite phones to be effective. Um, then you also had issues of interoperability, so limiting calls. Um, you have two cellular carriers on island, Digicel and a TCC, Tonga Communication Corporation. Um, so, you know, being able to communicate between the two carriers was also, you know, challenging. So pretty much they weren't able to communicate with each other. Um, and then network congestion. We've seen it all the time, even in American Samoa 2009 tsunami, lots of uh, no, no calls in and out. Um, uh, just a lot of lot a lot of traffic on the on the the network and then prioritization of emergency traffic in addition to that right so we're all focused on the main island of Tongatapu but there was also then no communication or limited communication with the outer islands and so you know they were pretty much don't know what's going on the outer islands didn't know what was happening in in um, the main islands, although they did hear, you know, all the signs that Laura was talking about, there was something going on, but we just don't know what it was. Um, and so, you know, this just gives you kind of the, the, a timeline. So this is based on sit reps that were issued by the uh, World Food Program. And so, you know, from the beginning, and this is on the communication aspect. So, in the beginning, when the domestic cable was cut, all the way up to you know reassessing the needs, what is it that we we need support for? Um, so you take a look at the first week. You had the, the cable was completely cut, and sat phones were hampered by the ash, and no communication with the outer islands. We moved into the second week. Uh, limited um, voice video data was restored. Sorry, no video, voice, SMS, texting, and data was restored. Uh, but there was need to increase the capacity for that, even to conduct, you know, kind of some sort of um, operation or even to get files over to, to Laura or the other way around or for Laura to send the files over to them. So the capacity needed to be increased. Um, and then also there was, you know, the request from the local government for additional chatty beetles to be sent. Um, and so that happened, the coordination for that had happened around that time. And so, you know, move along to the end of the month in January, then, you know, there was a, an assessment, right, to how, how much damage we're looking at for the submarine cable. And initial estimates as well for a time of repair, you're looking at about six to nine months. And that was because of the extent of the damage plus the, uh, um, the, the cable, the, it wasn't available, right, in the quantity that needed to, um, to, do, to restore the cable. Then we moved into February. So, you know, all the coordination of the, the global clusters um, have already started, begun to send in communication equipment um, and based on the needs that were identified from the countries, from the, the country, like what kind of satellite equipment, your VSATs, your BGANs, you know, all of these things that they know work. Uh, so that's what we were aiming for, what worked. Um, so lots of other solutions came in, you know, people had proposed, private companies, many, many different people had proposed certain solutions for, um, for our response, but what the, the, the community had settled on was what they know worked for sure at that time. Um, so, and that's what were sent over to the islands. And then all the way up to, you know, the, the 
in March, where then we we talked about the reassessment of the telecom needs. What does does that does that look like, and what role would each of these, you know, the private sector, the 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 donor countries, like what role would each of us in that sense would uh, be playing for that? And so, you know, I, I wanted to touch on. Um, you know, the use of the chatty beetle, you've heard this, this system um, that was being used. So uh, the chatty beetle is a two-way uh, texting system that's Iridium based. And so it was developed as an early warning system um, in the early 2000s. And then, you know, the functions of it, it had expanded to now being part of the operations of weather services. Um, and so they, you know, the countries ha are using it to send and transmit weather observation data that then feeds into the me meteorological models, the forecast models for weather. Uh, so these units were deployed out to the uh, outer islands and as in addition to the main islands of Tungatapu. But as Laura had mentioned, the unit in Tungatapu was not working. However, the outer island units were working and they were talking. Um, so, you know, the, the messages as, as here in uh, our office, as we're looking at tracking the traffic and just seeing what's happening um, after learning of the event in Tonga, and you see, you know, some messages were going out, um, you know, about 11 minutes after the eruption. And then you also hear, you know, in the in the traffic of it, they're saying, oh, we hear this rumbling sound from the south. You know, these are islands up north. Um, and, you, you, you know, they were describing their experience and what they were, were, were they weren't seeing anything. They were just, they were hearing things. Um, and so that, that is all captured in the messages that we're sending back and forth. And in addition to that, um, you know, once once we we started to okay, this is some this is what's happening. Like there, there was an eruption, so yeah. then then we were transmitting messages, um, you know, from 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 other sites. So just to kind of let the outer island know that this is what had happened. Um, there's no communication of, with the main island and then so forth. So um, the countries, the surrounding countries, uh, islands now got together and said, okay, how do we best support Tonga knowing that they don't have, um, you know, the, the, they don't have any eyes, right, so to speak in that. Um, so, you know, in the, the U.S. and as well as, you know, like Fiji and and WMO and all the different uh, countries that were uh, watching um, had, uh, you know, all provided support in in this in this um, in communications and weather observations. Um, and so, with a lot of coordination and um, kind of on the fly training, um, we were able to get some some data from the outer islands that were sent to the Fiji Meteorological Services for them to generate weather briefings and forecasts and then sent back to them. Um, in addition to that, you know, this was also a, mess, a way to communicate with families. Some of these uh, operators or technical meteorological techs who were out in the remote islands um, had family uh, elsewhere in the world. And so, you know, getting a message to them was, you know, really, really important to let people know that they were okay, at least in the in the outer islands. Um, and then much, much, of course, you know, this is also a time of COVID. So you also see some of that traffic to say, you know, there's a case here. We have five cases on this island. We have 178 cases here. So, you know, that also hampered a lot of the, the response, right, of for our um, for the communication side, so um, I promise that two more slides. This one, you know, challenges um, that the, our other two speakers have also touched on: limited communications, um, the relief of all the equipment and it, and other communication uh, supplies that we were sending in. Um, they were quarantined for some time before being released. Um, the availability of equipment and parts. And the manufacturers are, were also, you know, part of the bigger 
the challenges in trying to um, restore communication to the islands. And lastly, you know, some of the lessons that, uh, you know, that we got out of this is, um, you know, maintaining stock of equipment for emergencies has always been, you know, one of those things that um, kind of, you know, fail on at times, but uh, I think, you know, being in the region, our geographical location, the limitations of transport, um, it's very, very important. That's one of the bigger challenges that we have and continuing to, to try and address that in various different ways. So I'll leave it there um, and turn it back to Lily. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Ginger. I think you touched upon such a critical cross-cutting topic um, with regard to this response. You know, obviously, as you mentioned, communications affected everything across the board um, with regard to response of the scientific community as well as emergency management. Um, and then your personal um, involvement in the response just makes your perspective all the more unique. So thank you for sharing um, the challenges of this type of hazard in um, remote island communities. Um, I know that we're past the hour and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time who were able to join us. If possible, I would like to ask all of the panelists just quick one question, um, you know, in your perspective, what, what do we need in terms of education and training after what we've learned from this uh, incident? What do we need to improve upon in order to respond better for the next time? Anyone can go first and then we'll move to close. From a volcano point of view, um, we we're lucky to have a, um, Carol Stewart, for, who's part of the International Volcano Health Hazard Network here. And I think she and I both agree, uh, making sure we've got back pocket education, or, uh, um, impact and mitigation advice resources that are public friendly uh, to get out as the ash is falling and, and having those pre-approved by health and infrastructure agencies is really important. Uh, otherwise you're playing catch up. Uh, it, often the health concern for one to two weeks is far more um, than the actual acute impacts for one to two weeks. But having agreement that it's okay to say that is, is challenging and having the messaging worked out in a local context. So drinking water with ash in it one or two weeks, even with high flow, is probably better than not drinking water. Um, and especially if it's, you know, andesite, it's gonna be low fluoride, so it's fine. And breathing is often a concern, but the reality is ash is basically sand. And so it's like just being in a dusty environment. So you wanna protect yourself, but not be terrified of it. And so it's about having those messages ready to go and people confident to give them. And then the, the nuances, once we've done testing to adjust the longer term messaging, once we know if there are high fluoride or things like that. I'll just jump in and just do a, a general and an echoing, um, in many ways, the theme of Graham. Anything and everything we can do beforehand, um, that's going to be the key for whatever happens. Because what, what we learned here was comms went out, so all of a sudden the expertise in New Zealand and the expertise in Hawaii or, or was not available. So th they were on their own, literally on their own. and with whatever supplies, with whether, whatever materials they had, um, they had to be, like you said, confident to say and, and, and advise on what to do. Um, so anything and everything we can do to train, impart knowledge, impart um, what war stories, what works and what doesn't work is gonna help them um, in that moment. Um, and I'll just be general and then gender, I'll leave this to you now. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, absolutely what you folks have, have already said. So that event continues to highlight how fragile, um, you know, the global communication network is and how quickly everything can just go off. So definitely anything that we can pre-place would be helpful in any situation. So thank you. Thank you for your perspectives. And with that, on behalf of the NDPTC team, we'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their expertise and experience today. And thank you all for participating and taking this time out of your Thursday to attend our event. Save the date for next month. Um, our 
focus topic will be on cybersecurity, um, and we'll be circulating that announcement shortly. We're very excited to see you always, and thank you again for joining us. Aloha.